Thank you for joining us on the Watching Adams podcast. My name is Danny Ladoni, the publisher of Watching Adams, and the purpose of this series is to interview people familiar with Adams State who have the benefit of some retrospective insights and perhaps a little bit of distance from the institution itself. The purpose of this series is going to be looking at Adam State in ways that aren't necessarily examined otherwise and giving us the benefit of someone's candid and individual insights into the institution. This first episode is focusing on a former faculty member in the Human Performance and Physical Education Department named Spencer Harris. What makes this interview notable is that Spencer was a very successful younger faculty member who could have stayed at Adam State for much longer if only a few changes had been made. As Spencer goes on to talk about in the interview, he had a $1,000 problem, which was really just a misunderstanding about his pay. And in the grand scheme of things, that $1,000 was not a big deal, but for what it represented in terms of how he was treated by Vice President of Academic Affairs, Frank Novotny. Spencer reflects on exactly what this problem was and the larger significance that it had that caused him to leave Adam State and move to Colorado Springs, where he now teaches and, as he talks about, makes over twice the pay doing a very similar job. Without further ado, here is Spencer Harris on the Watching Adams podcast. <laughs> Spencer Harris. Um, I originally come from Cambridge in England. Um, my background is really in um, in sport uh, and a field called sport development, which really doesn't exist in quite the same way uh, in the US as it does um, in Europe. Uh, my education is primarily in sport development, which is kind of a combination between sport management and sport psychology. Um, I received my bachelor's from North London University in the early 90s, uh, went on to study a master's in sport development and uh, completed my PhD in sport policy, sport politics and sport management in 2013. Um, Most of my experience is still in the sport development field. Um, I've worked for a variety of agencies between 1992 and up to 2008. Um, government agencies like Sport England, not-for-profits like Right to Play um, and national governing bodies of sport um, like the Football Association and more recently Major League Soccer in the US, although that's not a national governing body, it's a a professional league that's closely related to one. So most of my experience is still in kind of professional sport and in 2008 I decided to pursue a career in academia. I really enjoyed the research components of my job in industry and really enjoyed facilitating workshops and public speaking and that kind of thing. So I decided that I would try my hand at um, a career in academia. really enjoyed it. Worked at a university for three years just outside of London um, in Hertfordshire in England. And uh, my wife is American and we always had a well, I claim it was a tentative agreement. She claims that it was contractually um, set, but uh, we would always come to America and spend equal time here as to what we had in England. And that's what really brought me to, um, to Adam State. I came to Adam State in 2011 um, to continue my career in academia, and since then I've moved on to, to UCCS in 2013 and have been here since then teaching on the sport management program. So just to clarify, you taught at Adam State between the years of 2011 and 2013? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So um, given your background, why did you decide to move to Alamosa? I mean, the, the primary driver was really personal. You know, it was about family commitment and my wife being American. She has family in Colorado. Uh, that's what led me to a job search uh, for open uh, positions in America in the first place, and, and in particular in the Rocky Mountain region, and you know the fact that it was Colorado, Colorado itself was even more attractive because it was even closer to her family. So that was really kind of the the primary driver. I, but supporting that, I mean, we came down to campus. Um, we received you know really 
friendly, really warm um, reception from various folk on campus. And it's it, Adams seemed like a really good place. It had a, it, we left there feeling very warm about um, Adams State. So the combination of looking for work um, in Colorado and together with coming down to Alamosa and, and meeting with various folk on campus really kind of convinced me that this was somewhere that could work. Great. Okay, so uh, initially it sounds like you thought of ASU as a very warm and friendly place. What were your experiences like in the classroom teaching? Um, there was definitely a, a culture shock, and that, was, that wasn't the students, that was me, and, and not being well adjusted. I mean, I literally left England on the Saturday, arrived in Denver, had to buy a car with my family, and then traveled down. Um, to Alamosa on the Sunday evening and taught my first class that Monday morning. So I wasn't as well prepared as I should have been, and I certainly hadn't given enough prior thought to cultural differences between students in the UK and students in um, the US. So that that was my um, that was my responsibility, and I should have done much more about that. I I, I was generally quite impressed with well. I think there is, a, there is a part of the student body at Adams that is exceptionally capable and exceptionally engaged in the pursuit of a, you know, acquiring knowledge, of testing themselves, challenging themselves, and you know, wanting, wanting to acquire um, greater intellectual capacity. And I came across a number of those students in our program, but but I learned very quickly that there is also a large group of the student body that are there for other reasons, primarily athletics, um, that are quite negative or down on the academic side of what the university is supposed to be about. Um, and actually quite, I started to see quite low esteem towards the institution, what the institution was trying to achieve, almost to the point where the knowledge side, the academic side of what the organization is supposed to be, be about was being belittled. Um, and the other part of the institution, the sport or athletic part of the institution being held in far higher regard. And still to this day, I'm not sure where that comes from. I'm not sure if that's something that's created and perpetuated by the student body or whether there are other forces at play within, particularly in the athletics department. I really, I really don't know, but I certainly felt it the longer I stayed at Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds like there may have been some improvements that could have been made. Um, did you notice any improvements you felt could be made? And if so, did you express those concerns? Yeah, I mean, we had regular... I, I thought the department was exceptionally well run. And uh, Bees and I, you know, we, we didn't, I don't think we saw eye to eye on absolutely everything, but I did think she ran the department really well. There were regular uh, meetings, uh, was ongoing communication. Uh, Bees was very proactive in trying to tease out areas of concern and things that could be improved. Um, I, I'm, in terms of, so certainly there was the opportunity to discuss these things within the department. Um, the interaction with administration higher up was, I have to say, fairly limited. Um, I think I had probably a formal meeting once with higher ups within the organisation, and maybe that's as much to do with me as it is them. You know, I'd only been there a couple of years, so that's certainly not an open criticism. But more could have been done, I think, to um, create a culture where there were folk higher up, certainly in the senior management team, that were wanting to know how how the organization was running um, at, the, at, the, at the grassroots level, so to speak, how things were going in the classroom, how programs were evolving, how faculty were developing, those kinds of things. Um, the biggest problem for me, and I think this is something that has affected HPPE, the, the HPPE department for some time now, and, and possibly it's been resolved. I've, I've lost touch, so I really don't know. But was the relationship between the work that HPPE are trying to do and the work that athletics are trying to do? And there's 
there are some definite issues there in terms of um, the individuals involved and those individuals being able to resolve differences and being able to work cooperatively and collaboratively for the benefit, not only for the student body, but for the benefit of sport. I mean, there's so much collaborative potential in what the athletics department are doing and what HPPE do. Um, you would think that it, it would be ludicrous for, for these folk not to be working closer to, uh, together, but it really isn't the case. There are some, I, I, again, I never really got to understand why, but there are there is a huge gulf in between those two departments and it almost seems like never the twain shall meet, um, which is a real shame and a real lost opportunity, I think. And obviously there's a lot of history there, um, a lot of problems that have gone before, but I, I hope the school's able to get to a point where those differences can be put to one side and they can start to cooperate and collaborate a little bit more uh, than they have done in the past. So other than your interactions with your department chair, Bees Shell, can you talk a little bit about your sense of the leadership at the ASU campus overall? Yeah, I, 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 I suppose initially I'd say it was nondescript. Um, and, uh, maybe the the strategic heads of each of the departments, you know, the departmental chairs, they would have far more day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week interaction. Um, so I suppose I don't have a direct line in there in terms of what I observed or what I saw or witnessed, but obviously being a member of faculty there for two years, I did get a sense of the culture and I did get a sense of how I thought leadership was operating, and I would call it laissez-faire. Um, pretty much hands off. Um, it felt like um, we were pretty much left to get on with things, which I suppose has positive and ne negative aspects to it. I, we needed an awful lot, lot more support in terms of um, personal development, in terms of dealing with challenges such as those I've just mentioned around um, cross-departmental collaboration or, or interaction. Um, and just dealing with very personal, personal professional matters like you know developing one's career or getting clarity on the tenure process or uh, being able to attend conferences, um, juggling a five-five load whilst also meeting research requirements, those kinds of things. And you know, as a relatively new member of faculty, I felt that that was, I felt that that was a miss from from senior management. That kind of support wasn't really there. And then as I got towards um, the tail end of, of my career, I actually had some very, and they're still to this day, bitter um, interactions with um, the provost, Frank Nobotny, um, which really were silly little quibbles over remuneration and payment, where, which you know, I look, at, look back at them now, and they were petty little power battles. Um, petty little squabbles about who held power and um, I, 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 like I said I, I still look back on those with, um, with on those discussions with frustration I, I was treated very very differently by people like him than I was when I first entered to Adams in my interview when I met people like Marty Jones who was just a, an upstanding and outstanding fellow and really um, I don't know, put Adam State in the best possible light. I mean, he was a guy that you wanted to work for and were willing to give everything to, and I really didn't feel like that towards senior management towards the end of my career at Adams. Yeah, so that's an area I wanted to focus on. It sounds like you had some challenges at Adam State, just like anyone would, and of course no organization is perfect. Um, but ultimately, I want to know more about why you didn't stay at ASU and some of those discussions that you had uh, with the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Frank Novotny, over remuneration and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, it's getting into squabbles about pay, but differences of, I was under the impression that the salary I would be offered was $1,000 more than my previous salary. Uh, that was the impression that I was given at the time of being offered the job um, informally after the interview. And then when Frank Novotny followed up more formally, he told me that that wasn't the case and that, that, that his best offer was what I was currently earning as a visiting professor, 
which went against completely what I'd been told by uh, the faculty members. And that really wasn't the issue. The issue, I mean, it's probably easy for me to say that now, but the issue on, on reflection wasn't about the thousand dollars. It was the way in which the matter was dealt with and the way in which I felt bullied into a kind of, will you accept this or thank you very much. You, you can go and we'll find the next best candidate. It really, it was demeaning and it really devalued what I thought the campus and ASU and the team I worked in thought of me. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think the team had any part in that. It was purely the way that, that Frank chose to conduct himself. And I found him, um, quite aggressive, um, uh, quite forthright style. And like I said, uh, he knew the bind that I was in it with a young family, etc., and that seemed to form no part of not not so much his decision, but no 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 part in how he conducted himself. So, would it be accurate to say that you felt somewhat exploited in your situation? That you didn't really have a lot of room for leverage, and the amount of money discussed, while a thousand dollars is not pocket change. In light of a year's salary, a thousand dollars is not especially significant. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I felt I, I wouldn't use the word exploited. I don't, I don't know that I felt exploited. I felt that there was an exceptional power imbalance, and the the person making the decision knew of the situation that I was in, and therefore I had two options: I either sucked it up and got on with it, or I left, and would, I chose to do the latter. Would you and, mind sharing with me uh, what your salary was? Yeah, my salary was forty-two thousand dollars as a as a visiting professor, and I was advised that uh, the salary would increase to forty-three thousand dollars as an assistant professor. Would you mind sharing me with me what you're currently making at UCCS? Um, it's more than double that. Would you say that your work and experience are similar to that of Adam State? Uh, my the, the work I'm doing here. Is, is exactly the same nature of the work that I was doing at Adam State. The only thing I'm doing differently is being given more time away from teaching to commit to um, scholarly work, research, publications. But you wouldn't say that you're working twice as hard or with twice as much merit as you were at Adam State? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, I don't think I've ever worked, in terms of actual hours worked, I don't think I've ever worked in any of the jobs I've done in the last uh, 25 years or so. I don't think I've ever worked as many hours as I was working at Adam State in order to deliver against the, the, the full four load and then the additional load that I did in each of the semesters. So you were working as hard as you ever had for the least pay, it sounds like. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, Danny, I accept part of that responsibility because when I joined ASU, I was, ta I was taking around about a 50% pay cut from what I was earning at the university I worked at in England. So I don't, I don't want to present a picture where I didn't, I knew what I was getting myself in for. I was shocked, I have to be honest. I was shocked at what the salary was. I was surprised by that. But that was presented to me in a far more amicable, far more friendly way by the person who led the search initially uh, than it was by uh, Frank Novotny, you know, it was presented in context. It was given against the, the, the financial resource difficulties that the school was in um, and presented in a far more cordial manner, a far more, you know, positive manner dealing with me as a human being rather than uh, somebody that was um, a, a pulse to fill a job. And if I didn't like it, then I could get on my bike and then find somebody else to do it, which is how I felt pretty much in the discussions that I had with Frank Novotny. So in your final analysis with Frank Novotny, it really did come down to a thousand dollars as to whether you would stay or go. And you made the somewhat unusual choice to, to say, no, I'm going to go. Did you do so because you believed there were better offers out there or why would you take that risk? Um, I, the moment I put the phone down and I spoke to President Svaldi um, in an exit interview that were, was set up prior to me leaving and I, I said exactly the same thing to him. The moment I put the phone down uh, on that conversation was the moment I decided I was leaving Adam State. But, but, but because the only way I could reclaim power was to leave. I was so upset with the way that 
that telephone conversation had been conducted, I no longer wanted to work there. I and, no longer wanted to work under that kind of leadership style. And just to be clear, this isn't really about the thousand dollars, but it was about how you were treated when you requested that amount of money and you saw in that power imbalance an organization that you no longer wanted to work for? Exactly. I mean, it, it, it would be easy for anyone to say, well, yeah, of course it wasn't about the thousand dollars and now, look, you're, you're, you're in a different position and, and, and doing much better financially. But at that moment in time, which is when I made the decision, this was all about the discussion and the way in which that discussion had been conducted. And I can only think if it was somebody different that was conducting that discussion, how I had originally been treated when I first came to Alamosa and spoke to members of faculty that were on the search committee, they would not have conducted themselves in that way. They wouldn't have spoke to me in the very direct, uh, and it, not so much demeaning, but just very direct terms, take it or leave it, uh, the that the, the discussion was conducted in. So I, I don't know whether I would have pursued other opportunities. Possibly I would have done um, had, a, had the discussion been conducted um, differently. But, but what I do know is I would have very unlikely put the phone down thinking, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my utmost to find myself a job elsewhere. I mean, I was looking into posts back in England, Danny, and the last thing I wanted to do was uproot my family and go back to England after having been only in the US for two years. But I was so I was so committed to making sure that I didn't stay at Adam State beyond that that, that term uh, that, that that I would have done that and if I have had if I had have had to do that to find myself work elsewhere. So in the final analysis, things could have ended differently and you still could be at Adam State. What would have to have happened for Adam State to retain you? Yeah, like I said, you know, when I was when I first came to Adam State in my interview, I, I went away exceptionally positive. Um, I, you know, I had some mixed emotions about whether geographically it was the, I'd never lived in a small town, I'd never lived so far away from a big city. All of those things that were challenges that were going through my head, but the reception, the way I was dealt with by the search committee, um, the way I was treated and, and respected, seemingly. Um, if, if that had have continued in the way that the assistant professor search was undertaken and the way that those discussions had have ensued, then I, I certainly wouldn't have put the phone down thinking, right, I've got to get my, you know, the only way I can reclaim power here is to find myself work elsewhere, which is how, how I left that discussion feeling. So I think if I'd have received more of what I got initially, um, I certainly wouldn't have been pursuing work elsewhere as aggressively as I did. So one thing that I understand, and I, I recommend your clarification here, is that after being hired at UCCS, you learned that some of your colleagues on the search committee had some perceptions about Adam State and your time there that may have adversely affected your application? No, no, no. No, sorry, I, I think I've... Uh maybe said something that's slightly confusing there. What, what happened, when I was first hired, I was hired as a visiting assistant professor. That was for a one-year position. And this is at UCCS? No, 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 no. This was at AS, sorry, this was at ASU. Okay. And then during that year, an assistant professor position became available in the program, and I applied for that um, position within ASU. The way that that search was concluded was very, very different to the way in which the original search for the visiting assistant professor was initiated. The different, I mean, night and day difference. With the original hire for the visiting um, professor position being conducted in a very open, very warm, very friendly, very positive environment. And the closing of the assistant professor position around about 12 to 18 months later being undertaken in what I would describe as quite a hostile bullying environment. Can you describe a little bit more what was hostile about it or what, what bullying you experienced? Yeah, maybe, you know, the, the hostility was around the um, not even being willing to enter into a discussion about what I had previously been told around what the terms and conditions of employment would be. So the fact that the 
the fact that Frank Novotny had a different impression of what those terms and conditions were is one thing. But the fact that there, that he would not even enter into a discussion or dialogue on what I had been told, uh, why that was inaccurate, um, why there had been a change, or, or any of that. The fact that, that, look, I think the conversation went something like that. Look, this is the offer on the table. Take it or leave it. And it was, I mean, some people like that level of directness, I suppose, or that um, distinct black and white uh, nature of, of discussion. But um, I certainly didn't appreciate that. Frank knew that I'd just had my second child, new, newborn child, a, a couple of months earlier. Um, so I think it was a fact of, you know, this is what it is. You're, you know, you're pretty much stuck here with that offer. And if you don't like it, find yourself something else. That's certainly my perception of, of the situation. And that's why when I put the phone down, I decided, right, I'll seek the latter path. I'll find myself something else. Thank you very much. So describing what you just told me, would you say that there was some degree of discrimination against you based on your family situation? Um, that, that your pay was being withheld from what you understood it to be because the VPAA knew that you weren't in a position to make a better offer? Yeah, I don't know that it, I don't know that it was discriminatory action. I mean, I think, I think Frank certainly was aware um, that I would, you know, I'd relocated my whole family from England only in a year earlier. We had two very young kids now. Uh, we'd come all the way to, to Alamosa and were setting ourselves up in, in various rented accommodations. And therefore, life was pretty difficult. It was, it was pretty not as difficult as some folk have it, admittedly, but still a pretty challenging set of circumstances. And, you know, therefore, probably the last thing we needed was another move. Um, I don't think that his decision to offer the 42000 was a, a discriminatory act. But I do think it was, um, I, I think it was pretty thoughtless, and, and more importantly, the the unwillingness. As I keep coming back to, the un, I, I can take, I can accept the decision to pay a thousand dollars less than less than what had originally been discussed. What I can't accept is a person who's not willing to enter into any kind of dialogue or discussion about why that's so. I mean, it sounds to me like more than discrimination against you personally, the university seems to just make a policy of saying, okay, you're in Alamosa, you're stuck here, so we're going to pay you what we feel like, and if you try to come back with a higher offer, we will stonewall you. Would you yeah. say that that's accurate? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we didn't even get that far, to be honest. I, I, I wasn't trying to negotiate a higher offer. It was simply, a, it wasn't like I was trying to bargain here for above what I'd originally been told was the, uh, was the amount. It was a case of I was under the impression, and maybe it was a miscommunication, maybe it was a misinterpretation, but nevertheless, I was under the impression that there was $1,000 extra to be paid. Um, and when I spoke to Frank about, oh, I thought the, I thought the salary for this post was at 43, it, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't the fact that no, it was 42. It was the it was the case that there was there was an unwillingness to discuss that to explain it to to sympathize to empathize it was just a case of well this is what it is you either accept it or you don't mm -hmm. um, okay but I guess what I was referring to earlier was since you've arrived at UCCS and colleagues of yours who know you're from Adam State have they expressed any impression of Adam State or of your time there yeah. Um, yeah, there have been a couple of incidents. I mean, the, I think there are folk that I work with now that um, advise that I don't promote to generally the fact that I've come from ASU. I don't think it's a school that's held in um, in high regard. It's not a school that the school here wants to be associated with, which I think is a shame. You know, I think that's one of the problems of Adam State, right, is, is perception ruling reality. And I think there is some really good work that goes on at Adam State, and I know that there are some some really good professors there doing very good work, and there are some exceptional students. So I, I don't think that perception re necessarily reflects reality. Um, but you know, there are there are there are certainly some things at Adam State, the culture being one, the treatment of faculty being another, that could be improved considerably. Uh huh. So my sense of what you just said is that. 
um, your colleagues advised you not to promote too heavily that you taught at Adam State? Yeah, I, I, there, you know, there, there were discussions with one or two faculty members here that um, the discussion that I had come from Adam State, let's put it this way, the discussion that I'd come from Adam State was around, well, let's not focus on that too much. Let's focus more on the fact that you're a graduate of Loughborough University and that's where you have your PhD from. Uh, and we, you know, we have to take this in the context, Danny, of me being in a, in a college of business now. So I'm in a setting where there are folk that do give attention probably more so than perhaps other um, colleges of, of where my studies have, have been completed and where my previous work uh, has been undertaken. And I, I wouldn't say that these are, you know, absolute letters of law, you must not do this and you must do this. It's more advice of, you know, you want to you want to associate yourself and have an affinity with certain high highly reputable um, organizations and institutions uh, rather than those that we perhaps don't class to be the same. Got it. So uh, wrapping up this interview now, um, are there any recommendations that you would make to the university moving forward based on your experiences? I mean, this may seem somewhat flippant, but I think a start would be to start treating faculty the same way that folk that work in athletics are treated. Um, and that that's an outsider's perspective, but it was, I was gobsmacked at the difference and uh, the, the prestige and profile that um, athletics seem to have against the bread and butter of the institution, which is the, the, the folk that make it a university, the academic staff and, and faculty members. And um, I think there's definitely a swagger to a lot of the folk that work in athletics and, and no wonder. Um, they seem to have an incredible uh, sway of influence and uh, authority and power within the institution, certainly um, the, the lion's share. So rebalancing that, rebalancing that power and making sure the faculty are equally respected, I think would be a start. Um, and I think a more inclusive culture. I think Adams does a great job at trying to think of an inclusive culture for students, but I don't think it does the same for staff and faculty. Um, and it, it, it does strike me, looking back at my time there as, a, an, as an institution that was um, awfully hierarchical uh, in terms of how business was conducted. Um, I think the departmental meetings went a long way to sharing um, ideas and discussing things at the programmatic level uh, and you know members of staff in the department should be commended for that because I think bees and, and and the staff within HPP did a great job there but more needs to be done at the senior and middle management level across the whole institution in terms of um, collaborative and democratic decision making across uh, the, the whole academy so you talked a moment ago about the influence that Adam State Athletics had over the institution. You talked a little bit about many students who might have been less than engaged in their academic work because they were really there for athletic-related reasons, and also the resources and respect that you saw uh, members of the athletics um, community and administration side of the university commanded. Can you talk a little bit more about what you observed and why you saw that as being problematic? Yeah, I just think, you know, this wasn't something that led to me ultimately wanting to leave Adam State. It was just a, one of those mild day-to-day um, -day frustrations where you got the sense that athletics just, they held a privileged position within the institution. Uh, they seemed to be able to conduct themselves um, with an air of authority that, that um, faculty weren't able, uh, they seem to be able to not only retain budgets, be able, but be able to grow their budgets against a, a backdrop of increasing financial um, cuts and freezes on salary and freezes on recruitment, um, development of new facilities, etc. So, you know, particularly being a foreigner coming in and, and really not having the same collegiate athletic system in the UK, it was really surprising to me. I mean, there isn't an institution that you'll go to um, in Europe where um, coaches and folk working in athletics have that amount of influence. So maybe that was, you know, for me, it was even more striking or more stark because I came from that, that background or from that context. But, um, 
yeah, it was just a mild frustration in terms of how is it that how is it that the university strategy and leadership um, can um, uh, c- can give athletics so much favour over the academic institution? I mean, surely the reason people come here is to pursue a degree. It's it's a degree granting institution. It's a university first and foremost. Athletics, in my mind, was uh, a secondary part of of that package. But it never seemed to play out in that way, you know. And you know, some of the, I suppose, some of the behaviours of, of coaches and uh, athletic staff spoke a lot to that. Um, like I said, some of the financial decisions that were made around facility developments and, and program budgets, etc., also kind of reinforced that. And I think that, it, it, like I said, it wasn't a factor that led to me kind of stomping back to my office thinking, "Oh, I'm, I'm leaving." But it was a a frustration and I think culturally it's something that affects um, the morale of, of folk working at Adam State and um, it's not hard to see why. Yeah, so it's one thing to have a vibrant athletics program and there's certainly arguments that some have made that athletics is really what has uh, encouraged the recruitment and retention of students and essentially helps to pay your salary, Spencer Harris, even though it's $1,000 less than you thought it would be. Um, But you're saying that athletics, to some degree, has a detrimental effect on the academic potential of a degree-granting institution. Is that correct? Well, I think it's... I, I understand the, the, the counter-argument in terms of the, the value and, and role that, that a, a well-structured, uh, well-put-together athletics program can play in an institution, and I'm certainly not criticising that. I just think it's about having a balance of power and having decisions that are made that are in the whole interest of the academic institution not just in the interests of sports or athletics. And, you know, as an outsider looking in, it always seemed to me that there was an inequality in terms of allocation of resource, but more importantly, in terms of where the power lay around decisions that was that favoured athletics over the faculty. And, and yes, I understand that a good number of, of, um, of athletes or a good number of students that came to Adams came because of athletics, um, but to sustain, but to sustain those student athletes and to continue to grow the academic institution and the integrity of the institution, there has to be a rebalancing of power between faculty and athletics. Otherwise, you end up with a school that does um, makes its decisions and does as well as it possibly can on the sports field or on the track and ends up compromising the academic integrity of, of what it's trying to do on the educational side. So for, for me, it's just a case of rebalancing, rebalancing who has power, rebalancing where financial resources are invested, um, and rebalancing the, the priority given to various voices in the decision-making process. Uh, and then just based on this interview, uh, I would also ask you, um, assuming Frank Novotny listens to this um, podcast at some point, uh, what would you like him to know, or is there anything that you would say to him uh, moving forward? No, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't hold grudges, Danny, and what, what's done's done. I just wish that we'd have had a more, a more open and more respectful dialogue than we did. And had we have done that, maybe in a completely different situation to the one I'm in now. Um, you know, more than anything else, just treating people with um, a bit of dignity and a bit of respect goes an awful long way. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I, I, I you know, I it may not have seemed like it from the interview, Danny, but I still look back on some fond times that I had at, at Adams, particularly with the folk within human performance and some of the other faculty members in other departments and you know, some of the students that I got to work with. So it certainly isn't all um, stresses and sore points in my memory. I had some some wonderful times down there, and I just wish things hadn't have gone the way that they ended up going. I can understand and relate. Well, thank you, Spencer, so much for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate having you on uh, Watching Adams, and uh, I hope you take care. Okay, you too, Danny. Cheers. All right, bye-bye.